Hi everyone, my name is Catherine. I'm a physio in Ennis Hospital. Um, this isn't very scientific compared to this morning. Basically, we've been running a pulmonary rehab programme for the last, um, since May 2011, so I just thought I'd present some of our preliminary results. Um, firstly, I'd just like to acknowledge my colleagues Mary Durvin and Neve O'Shea, physios who I work with who set up the programme, and Carmel McInerney, <coughs> the respiratory nurse specialist, um, Aidan O'Brien, who oversees the programme. Um, our pharmacy department, as well as Jean Saunders, who completed the statistical analysis. So, um, one of the reasons we set up the program was with, we noticed in the, our inpatient unit that there was a lot of patients coming in with COPD exacerbations, and this has been found by the ESRI as well to be very um, that people with COPD do come in like 20% of inpatient beds and that they do reckon by 2030 that COPD will be the third most frequent cause of death and ranked seventh in the worldwide burden of disease. Um, so the Global Initiative for COPD, they do recommend that you do run pulmonary rehab programmes and it has been found to be very effective within the literature, um, including the, re uh, the 2011 Cochrane Review. Um, so we set up the program um, in May 2011. We had kind of done a pilot thing, with, a pilot program with NUID, their Prince program. So we had a bit of a uh, knowledge on it, and then we set up our own program. Um, so some of the goals that we set were um, to provide a multidisciplinary approach to patients in Clare living um, with COPD, to educate patients on exercise, increasing to hopefully aim to increase their physical activity levels and fitness. Um, to help so that they would learn how to self-manage their respiratory symptoms, including things like sputum clearance and managing breathlessness, and to improve health-related quality of life and to improve psychological functioning. Um, so in terms of uh, referral, um, anyone who has a diagnosis of COPD, now that can encompass any sort of um, you know, airflow obstruction. So we do have people who might be on the waiting list for a lung transplant or who may be um, you know, they range from, you know, up to end stage COPD and that, or maybe palliative patients as well, who might want to come on the programme, so it is very broad. Um, they do need to have a recent ch chest x-ray, spirometry results and ECG results, and these are all reviewed by Dr Aidan O'Brien in, in Limerick Hospital, and he deems whether people are suitable or not suitable to take part. And then in Ennis we do all the pre and post assessments, we also do six months and 12 months post assessments as well, and they include like subjective measures and objective measures which I'll present in the results. Um, the structure of the class, it runs for eight weeks and there's a class on a Monday afternoon and Thursday morning and it's mainly exercise component but then we have a strong education component as well. It's become over the years very multidisciplinary, not everyone is based at Ennis but we do have people coming in from the community. So there's a physiotherapist and then the respiratory nurse specialist who run the programme. There's also the respiratory consultant who so, um, does come and do a talk. The pharmacist on site, an OT comes over from St Joseph's Hospital. There's a psychologist who comes in from the community, um, the oxygen company rep and the community welfare officer and they all are kind of tied in with the education components we run. So example the community welfare officer talks about entitlements and the um, psychologist would talk about managing stress and that and the um, OT would talk about um, energy conservation in the home and techniques for that. Whereas the physio and the nurse would run things like the, um, you know, how to use inhalers properly, uh, smoking cessation, exercise, um, diet, nutrition and things like continence because <coughs> continence can be a huge issue with patients with COPD because they would be coughing a lot. The programme itself is um, 10 stations, the exercise programme which they do twice a week, so there's aerobic exercises, upper limb exercises which are a huge component and then lower limb strengthening exercises and there are three minutes each at each station. And um, what we would do is we go around the class and monitor, make sure everyone is sort of pushing themselves a little bit. So we use the uh, modified Borg um, breathlessness scale. So we kind of try and aim that they're working at around stage three or four on that so that the breathlessness is moderate or somewhat <laughs> severe. Um, and then we also would calculate their early warning score pre and post the programme um, just to make sure that their, um, you know, their MU score isn't too high. So that's similar to what you would use in the hospitals. Um, we've run 13 programmes to date and we've had more than 120 people complete the programme. Um, Jean Saunders and UL has statistically analysed 38 of the subjects, so we hope to um, put some more through as well. 
there's um, kind of 21 male to 17 female and as you can see from the age range it ranges from 48 to 84 and that does you know there's as I said a very big variability in COPD severity and the attendance is very good it's usually 14 out of 16 but if you run an analysis at winter a lot of people tend to get exacerbations then so there isn't as a lot of people might end up in hospital and that so it does vary throughout the year. Um, in terms of our preliminary results there, this is the uh, chronic respiratory disease questionnaire. So in, to, to kind of understand a bit better, there's a significance of 0.5 is clinically significant, one is moderate significance, and then 1.5 would be very um, significant, um, high significance. So you can see that in dyspnea, fatigue, emotion and mastery, that the scores did improve. Now the closer you kind of get to seven, that <coughs> means that they feel able to master their own respiratory symptoms. Um, again, with the sort of objective measures, there is the shuttle walk test and the endurance shuttle walk test, so they both increase significantly pre and post the programme. I don't have the six or 12 month um, analysis. Unfortunately, not as many people come back to do the six and 12 month analysis, so we don't have as many results from that. But um, they both, like for example, the endurance shuttle walk, they'd go from you know, 300 up to um, over 700. That's sort of that they walk at the same pace, whereas the incremental shuttle run is a bit like a, a modified version of the beep test, if anyone's familiar with that, and they increase, you increase the speed until they can't keep up with the beats. So they've improved in that as well. Other um, significant differences were the COP assessment tool. Their pre-scores it showed that they had a high kind of a did impact on their daily life. Anything over 20, it's out of a score of 40. Um, and then post, it shows that they've a moderate, it kind of moderately impacts on their day-to-day -day life. So there was improvements there. Um, the HADS, which, you know, that um, they didn't really tend to, from that, have very high depression or anxiety scores, but there was kind of reduction in depression scores there, and also their grip strength improved. We did also measure a lot of uh, one rep max in terms of upper limb and lower limb, but um, we haven't analysed those either. Um, so just in general, the future outlook, it's, we get a lot of very positive feedback from the programme. Unfortunately, our waiting time at the moment is actually over 10 months and we don't have any scope to increase the number of programmes. We've only got 0.2 of a whole time equivalent. We find when we get them back at 6 and 12 months, I've mentioned that, that they don't tend to be doing as many of the exercises, but whilst they're doing the programme, they're very active. So kind of goals from that, we would like to kind of run more back-to-back -back programs. Like last year, for example, we only ran two programs because we'd unfilled maternity leave, whereas hopefully we'd run a lot more programs throughout the year, like usually about four, um, four to six a year. We'd like to run a refresher program for those who've already completed the program, just to kind of boost them again in terms of um, getting them back a actively doing the exercises. Um, we don't have a dietitian for the diet nutrition component, which would be important. Um, and also we've been finding that some of the patients who've done the program a few years ago have been coming in with balance impairments into the inpatient unit. So we're wondering whether we should be looking at pre and post balance assessment because recent research has said COPD patients do have impaired balance, mainly due to their, you know, um, like just weakness and that. And so that would be an interesting th component to look at and whether our program with all the exercise we do does actually impact on that. Um, and then the big question with every kind of program you run is kind of adherence, long-term behaviour changes. They really engage whilst they're there and then once they stop, they stop. So it's trying to get that long-term behaviour change going. And another sort of like the depression scores, although they weren't very high, it's just maybe how is that program? Because a lot of people with COPD do have anxiety and depression a lot due to their breathlessness, due to the fact that they can't go out much. So it's like, how is this program helping their scores? Because some of the patients would have scored very high in their depression and after the program are um, much lower. So again, just acknowledgements to the senior physios, um, Mary Durvin, Neva Shea, and the respiratory nurse, Carmel um, McInerney. And that, so any questions for that? Thank you. Good afternoon everybody, I'm delighted to be here. I'm Maeve Barry from the Department of Nursing and Midwifery and um, my study here today is evaluating expectant parents' knowledge, satisfaction and use of a self-instruction infant CPR kit. Sorry. 
Um, the idea for this uh, project came with a conversation with Mary Gamble, who was a former medical research officer in the Graduate Entry Medical School. <coughs> we were actually across the road in the maternity hospital when she said, Maeve, can you tell me this? Do you um, teach parents the skills of infant CPR? Because a medical student um, was telling me that he was in a GP surgery and a mother ran in with her baby and the baby was in need of resuscitation. So as a midwife and midwifery background myself, I said, well, actually, no, we don't. We just, um, unless, of course, the baby's in the neonatal unit or something like that, not, no, we don't normally teach expectant women or their parents, parents the skills of infant CPR. It didn't seem like a very um, right answer to me, so I started off looking at the literature around about it. And um, what the literature would say um, that um, babies in the neonatal unit, um, that they are taught the skills of infant CPR, but there's very, very little literature around um, teaching parents. And um, I suppose what made it anyway feasible would be the, the Lynch study in 2005, where um, the efficacy of self-training kits were proven so that instead of a four-hour training program, which wouldn't be reasonable at all across the way in a busy unit, self-training kits um, now raise that possibility. So following on from that, with um, discretionary funding from the National Children's Research Centre, I started on this journey. So the objectives were to assess parents' knowledge of infant CPR prior to and on completion of infant resuscitation skills training, and to assess parents' use and satisfaction with an infant CPR anytime kit, and to evaluate the medium-term impact of training of infant CPR skills um, at six months. So um, I did a pre-test, um, post-test design, and uh, with eth ethical approval, and um, the sample size was um, chosen from the uh, parents, expectant parents attending the antenatal classes between December and January 2013. And so any women and their partners who wish to attend, they just came early for the class on the um, baby, baby education. So the intervention itself was a, a kit which um, had a 22-minute self-instruction DVD and an infant mannequin um, to facilitate the skills. And the parents used a practice while watching technique. The, the kit itself is developed by Lairdell and um, sponsored by the American Heart Association. So each uh, couple had a <coughs> kit to um, practice on in the class and to take home. So there was no direct teaching provided. Um, so the questionnaire was adapted from the um, Irish Heart Foundation CPR Schools Evaluation Study and there were uh, 10 infant CPR knowledge items which were um, multiple choice questions. Uh, there was one item on confidence uh, with a, using a five point Likert scale and one item on willingness to use infant CPR measured as well with the Likert scale. Um, I also wanted to see if there was any uh, multiplier effect and also and in particular, and, and really useful as well, was to um, acknowledge three knowledge items around infant choking, which is a very um, useful skill for parents. Um, there was open-ended comments and invited comments as well. So data was collected at three, three time points, um, immediately prior to training, um, immediately following training, and at six months. And uh, data analysis using um, uh, SPSS and the mean and medium was identified and so on we go. Just to say the characteristics of the sample were um, women who were, uh, there were 42 women and they were 32 weeks gestation or greater expecting their first baby. Um, we had 33 partners and um, we had two support people, one granny, not the great granny, one granny and one sister. And um, the participants, their training, um, they had very, very training, but only, uh, only two people had uh, CPR training in the recent uh, two years. Um, so, on we went. You can see um, the sample size was 77 before, 76 after, and 58 at six months. So I know this is a busy slide, but I just want to point out that um, you can see the, just the scores for the knowledge and the, and the steps were, were all based on the steps of CPR. And so you can see, um, for instance, if you look at question seven there, um, the pre-training correct answers were um, 57.1% and post-training correct was 98.7. And for the question eight, on what depth should you push down on the chest, 19.5 or 15 got it right 
pre-training and following training, 96.1 or 73 post-training, and at six months, 55.2 or 32 people got it correct um, at six months. And just as a graph to see and the percentages of the correct um, scores, knowledge uh, for knowledge of infant CPR, you can see um, from the from here the pre-correct action if an inf infant isn't breathing, 16.9 um, got it um, right before training, after training it was 100% and at six months it was 75.9. So um, another example there, you can see position of the tips of the fingers, 57 before training, 98 <coughs> after and 79 um, follow on at six months. And just an, as another example, for correct positions for breath, 66 before, 88 after, and 72 on. So you can see there is a difference. So um, the mean knowledge score showed that the mean knowledge um, was 3.3 and 8.8 after, and 6.1 at six months. And just, I did look and see was there a difference between uh, male and men and women. And um, while the women's score was lower before, um, when you were there and watching as, as the, the couples were practicing, the women were extremely intent and nudging their partners to watch and see and do it correctly. And I think, I know I shouldn't infer anything from this, but I do. They were very um, focused and, um, and they were enjoying it and they were having fun doing it. But, um, so you can see that there was um, uh, statistically significant results, pre-training, post-training, pre-training follow-on and post-training follow-on. Um, then willingness to give infant CPR, you can see like that uh, before training they were unsure whether they would give infant CPR or not and then following, it, following on they definitely would give CPR, 80.3 definitely would and again at six months they would definitely give CPR. So there, the effects of the training on confidence was really, really um, great that they, before it they definitely weren't confident at all, 53.9. But after training, they, they're more than average, 53% were more than average confident to perform infant CPR and, and that was sustained at, um, you know, at six months as well. So um, they really, really were willing to show other people, they really felt that their grandparents and their friends should know about infant CPR and um, their, their babysitters, they discussed it amongst their, their colleagues at work and um, they shared the kit. So the kits were shared with 45 family members and friends. Um, very interestingly, in relation to knowledge, in, in relation to infant choking, a big survey done in the UK um, showed that parents, almost 50% of parents didn't know what to do in the event of choking, so you can see there. So just to um, give a little bit on the, um, their qualitative comments. They felt that the, this was an excellent program that demonstrated the baby was very useful and practical and I thought I was doing the chest presses and breathing correctly but I wasn't and the practice baby shows you if you are not very clearly with the clicking noise and the rising chest and um, just satisfaction. I appreciated the opportunity to learn. This was not something I had considered but now feel happier knowing it. Having the kit to teach others is great, sharing the knowledge, great job. So um, it was, it's very clear to say that they were very satisfied, they recommended that the maternity services should facilitate infant CPR and just the words I think are important that an infant's life is too precious to leave to chance and paramedics. I believe first response for all infant, infant incidents is vital and training brings security to parents. This is a real issue but as a first time mother I definitely felt that in a situation of my baby stopping breathing I could make some effort to help. So in summary, their knowledge increased their confidence levels and their willingness to um, teach um, CPR. And just to acknowledge um, the maternity and um, STAR, the C star and other people in it and to say that the, this project has moved a little bit in outline discussions to move it to the next level. Um, and, and this has been with discussions with um, the medical school, with um, um, FEC and with um, the Maternity Hospital. Thanks very much. So hello everyone, my name is Aoife Hughes. I'm, I'm a recent UL graduate and I'm currently working as an intern in the University Hospital Limerick. 
So the title of my presentation today is a cluster analysis of sleeping patterns of nine-month-old infants and the association with maternal health, results from a population-based cohort study. My co-authors include Dr. Stephen Gallagher and Professor Ailish Hannigan of the University of Limerick. So infant sleep problems are commonly reported by their mothers in the first year of life. Um, the area has been extensively researched in the past 10 years with many uh, studies demonstrating infant sleep patterns in different populations. So the main objective of this study was to identify using cluster analysis novel sleep phenotypes in a population-based cohort of infants. So to date, um, there has been no studies that have used this type of analysis to describe um, infant sleep patterns. The second part of the study was to explore the, the associations between infant sleep profiles and their mother's health and well-being. So the study design, it was a cross-sectional analysis of a cohort study. The data source was from the Growing Up in Ireland National Longitudinal Study of Children. So basically, um, infants born between December 2007 and May 2008 were randomly selected from the Child Benefit Register. Mothers were invited to participate in the study. Of those invited, 69% um, responded, leaving a sample size of 11,134. So mothers self-reported infant sleep patterns at nine months and multiple health-related variables. These included validated um, questionnaires um, for parental stress, so the parental stress score, and the CSD, which records uh, presence of depressive symptoms. So the, the unique nature of this study was to use a two-step hierarchical cluster analysis. So this type of analysis is um, very useful when faced with a large data set with a large number of variables. And what it does is it identifies unique clusters within the data set that have unique um, characteristics or similar characteristics. So because of the large um, sample size of, the, of this um, study, to further add significance to p-values, um, additional statistical tests were utilised. <coughs> So the results were that there were four distinct clusters identified um, with distinct sleep profiles. So if we look at the first one, so this was um, the largest sleep cluster with 58% of infants lying within this cluster. And these were our good sleepers. So in this group, no mother reported a sleep problem. So the sleep variables used to, to um, use in the final clustering system was infant and parental sleep duration, the number of infant wakenings per night, and the usual sleep location of the infant during the night, and also how much the mother reported the baby's sleep as a problem. So we can see in cluster one here are good sleepers, um, that these infants and parents slept the most, they were, the infants were less likely to wake during the night, they all slept in their own cot or bed, and none of the parents reported their sleep as a problem. Our second group is the smallest group, it includes 11% of infants, and these are what we call our poorer sleepers, so they have the least favourable sleep patterns. So all mothers in this uh, group report a moderate or large sleep problem, and infants wake an average of three times per night. So we can see here in this group that both infants and parents sleep the least when compared to other clusters. The infants are most likely to wake um, and the parents are most likely to report the, the infant sleep as a moderate problem um, with 33% reporting a large problem. So our third cluster is um, unique in that it is mostly um, classified by co-sleepers. So almost 90% of infants in this group were sleeping in the parental bed. Um, and this includes 12% of all the infants in the study. And then our final cluster is a group where all mothers reported a small problem. All infants are sleeping in their own cot. Um, however, infants are waking on average of 12 nights. And this is included 19% uh, of the infants in the sample. So here we can see in cluster 3, um, which is our co-sleep, it's most similar to... Um, it's the sleeping patterns are least are less favourable and similar to cluster two in that um, infants and parents are sleeping um, less and um, that all all infants are in the parental bed or either with siblings and the parents report either a small or moderate problem. So the next stage of the study was to compare these um, clusters and see if they were associated with poor maternal health outcomes. 
So again, this has been widely described in the literature, and we expected that infants, parents of mo or mothers of infants that sleep um, the least would be more likely to be associated with poorer maternal health outcomes. So this further validated um, our clustering system. So as you can see here in cluster two, our least favourable cluster, um, parental stress scores were highest. Um, they also had highest um, scores in their reports of um, depression symptoms. They're also more likely to have a chronic physical or mental illness, and they were more likely to report self-report their current health as fair or poor. So the conclusion, so this demonstrates infant sleep profiles with a distinct uh, phenotypical framework. Um, our le less favourable clusters are significantly, significantly associated with maternal stress, depression and poor maternal um, overall health. So we feel this is a valuable tool to demonstrate the wide spectrum of sleeping behaviours in the Irish um, infant population. And this can be used further in a clinical session or healthcare training. So our plans for future study. So we plan to follow up these infant clusters at three years. And the aim is to determine if the infants in the least favourable category are associated with poor maternal health or child outcomes. And currently there's a manuscript being resubmitted to the Maternal and Child Health Journal on this paper. So my acknowledgements, I'd like to thank the Growing Up in Ireland National Longitudinal <coughs> Study of Children, the Irish Social, Social Science Data Archive for um, allowing access to the data, and of course the UL Graduate Entry Medical School and both co-authors. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Neil O'Driscoll. Uh, I am currently an intern in University Hospital Limerick and the title of my study today is Comparing Cardiovascular Risk Factors, Disease and Treatment in Participants with Rheumatoid Arthritis, Osteoarthritis and Without Arthritis in a Population-Based Study. So just as a background to this, uh, rheumatoid arthritis is associated with a significant increase in mortality compared to the general population with the leading cause being cardiovascular disease and this is well established and documented in the literature. And uh, the relationship between osteoarthritis and CVD has not been studied extensively in population-based studies, although there is some evidence that risk factors and CVD are more prevalent in OA. So the objectives uh, for this study were to compare the prevalence and treatment of modifiable cardiovascular risk factors and compare the history of cardiovascular disease in participants with rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, and without arthritis. And we also looked at the treatment for hypertension across all three groups. So the participants uh, for this study were obtained from the Irish Longitudinal Study on Aging, which is a population representative prospective cohort study with a sample size of 8,500 uh, subjects. Uh, all participants are aged uh, over 50. And each member of the Irish population, uh, age 50 and older, had an equal probability of being invited to participate in this study. And it's approved by the TCD uh, Research Ethics Committee. So from this study, uh, data from the first wave of the study, which was conducted between 2009 and 2011, was analysed. So of the 8,500 participants, uh, a subset of uh, 5,880 were selected for analysis. And this subset was based on participation in a health assessment. And from this health assessment, the availability of blood pressure and blood lipids. The uh, assessment was uh, self-reporting data. So uh, an interviewer went into the home and provided a computer-assisted personal interviewing where they had a set number of questions and the questions were then logged into a database. And based on the uh, CAPI, it was 62% of these participants uh, participated in a health assessment. And the health assessment uh, recorded a number of objective variables which included blood pressure, blood samples, um, BMI was calculated on height and weight. They uh, underwent an international physical activity questionnaire and the, their antihypertensive medication was measured by the actual investigators looking at their medication and recording this, uh, which is stronger than uh, self-report. Uh, so our sample analysis then, uh, we use sampling weights in all analysis to account for selection and participation bias. 
and these were constructed on age, sex, uh, educational attainment and marital status. Um, we adjusted for a number of different variables throughout the study which included age, sex, obesity and physical activity. <coughs> we had a number of different models then, uh, one was for obesity and uh, another was for antihypertensive medication which adjusted for obesity and physical activity. Uh, logistic regression models were used and we use uh, the odds in the next tables are presented with the odds ratio and analysis conducted with the IBM SPSS. Um, so here's our first uh, table of data. 5% uh, level of significance is used uh, with all the sample sizes here. And just of note, uh, while differences across the groups were stati statistically significant across all variables, uh, the effect sizes were actually small just due to the large sample size of the study, uh, except for uh, gender, self-reported hypertension and high cholesterol in rheumatoid arthritis. So this is the second uh, table here. So this summarizes the odds of self-reported cardiovascular risk factors and diseases across all three groups after adjusting for age and sex. So as we can see from the data here, uh, those with RA actually had higher odds of multiple factors uh, compared to the reference group of no arthritis apart from uh, diabetes. Whereas in, with osteoarthritis, uh, they had higher odds um, of hypertension, high cholesterol, heart murmur, and an abnormal heart rhythm. So, uh, inclusion uh, participants with rheumatoid arthritis were more likely to be physically inactive compared to those without arthritis. And uh, this is interesting um, that the not the odds of being physically inactive were similar in OA to those without arthritis and that the difference was actually only observed uh, in those with rheumatoid arthritis. Um, there was no evidence of undertreatment of hypertension in participants with arthritis in this study and while participants with RA and OA were more likely to be taking antihypertensive medication than those without arthritis. Um, this was explained when we adjusted for obesity and physical inactivity, but this was only in those with rheumatoid arthritis, but it wasn't for those in osteoarthritis. And this is actually in contrast to a number of other studies uh, which showed that the increased prevalence of hypertension was due to increased age and BMI in both rheumatoid arthritis and also osteoarthritis. So there were just a few limitations to this study, uh, one being that it was uh, self-reporting of medical history, physical activity and diagnosis of arthritis. And in particular, maybe with, the, with arthritis itself, if you were to ask a lot of patients uh, what type of, if they have arthritis and then ask what type of arthritis, a lot of them actually are unsure which type of arthritis they have. It's also a cross-section analysis. Um, however, this is the, in the Irish Longitudinal Study on Ageing, this was taken from the first wave of data and these, this cohort is going to be followed over the next 10 years, every two years for the next 10 years and this will provide uh, an opportunity for a longitudinal analysis over uh, this period of time. And just some acknowledgements then, um, the, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Prof Eilish Hannigan and uh, my co-authors and uh, the Irish Longitudinal Design on Ageing for providing access to the data. Thank you. Good afternoon ladies and gentlemen and uh, thank you very much for inviting us to speak here. Um, I'll do the acknowledgements first. These are the, the people who are principals in, in this particular study, but I have to thank everybody here because there's been a lot more workers that have contributed to this database that I'm going to talk to you about. Uh, they're all physiotherapists, by the way. These are two recent graduates, PhDs. In fact, that's a third recent graduate PhD. And there's um, a, a new PhD here and uh, an old stalwart, uh, Suzanne Coot, like myself. So this is about a composition study, and our main aim is to study the anthropometric phenotype of the Irish adult. We use an IDEX, and that's actually quite important for you to recognise at this point, because it is a platform base, and I'll, I'll, that'll become relevant later. And we're using the IDEX at this time to look at age-related change in lean tissue mass. So why study body composition? Well, um, there's several reasons, but what I'd like to identify firstly, that the, the population body composition is necessary to allow really an evidence-based approach. 
And that approach can inform all sorts of things. Clearly, the abnormalities involving the three major components here, both of fat, lean, and bone mass. But this is one we really do benefit from. The ability to actually establish very narrow, homogeneous range of entry into trials. If you want to look at somebody who's, who's got abdominal obesity, you measure abdominal obesity and take those people through. Equally, if you want to know somebody who's osteopenia, you take people with osteopenia. You don't sort of search widely. And second, and the third thing is that it, there is many multidisciplinary research projects and epidemiological studies that benefit from these data. How do we approach it? Well, in order to do this work, you won't be using BMI. If you look at the graph on the right here, the schematic on the right here, these are two people who match with BMI who are 40 years apart. This is a, this is a mature adult. This is what you call a young, old adult, according to the World, or the World Health Organization. They've both got the same BMI, but as you can see in this cross-section to the thigh, the musculature here is very more pronounced, and the fat here is very much more pronounced. So the approach, has, the approach that's suggested that we do under, under current consensus is that low lean mass, I'm not going to call it sarcopenia at the moment, low lean mass could be identified effectively by the appendicular lean muscle mass. And that can be stature normalised, as you can do with a body mass index, so that you get an appendicular lean tissue mass index. And the way we would look, to, I'd look at that from a normal population is take a mature young adult population, find their young adult median value off a fairly representative sample, clearly population specific, the standard deviation, and then use the Z-score to map out what that population looks like and to compare other age groups, etc., to it. So what you would have here is a normal range. The difference between the, Z, the, the um, appendicular and tissue mass scores, which are greater than one standard deviation or less than that, would give you a sort of pre-sarcopenia, it's termed class one sarcopenia mostly in the literature. And then anything greater than one, greater than two, would give you a class two sarcopenia or total sarcopenia. The threshold for which these values of the appendicular tissue mass are as yet have a consensus value. So I'm not going to, I'm going to give you an argument against that and I'll show you how that works when you compare across them. In order to present this to the general public, they don't understand Z scores and T scores. So it's actually a very good idea for, for both for prevalence and for able to be able to match themselves into a population. We use an LMS program here to actually generate these centile curves. So we have age-related centile curves of this principal variable that we're going to use here for lean body, lean body tissue. Okay, so how do we start? Well, we started by recruiting from a convenience population. I stress this now, it's convenience. It's not a a generalised population, a convenient population to the University of Limerick. And we started with about a thousand men and women. Okay? And we measured the appendicular lean tissue mass, which is basically the sum of lean tissue mass in the legs and the arms. And we came up with the median value and the standard deviation. So for these thousand, roughly 500 each of men and women, what we have here is a, an appendicular lean match uh, median of about 9.3 <laughs> kilograms per metre squared okay, stature. And if you look for here, the women is about 7, 6.97. When you then classify sarcopenia, anybody less than 8.3, in, uh, in between 8.3 and 7.3 is class 1 sarcopenic. For men, greater than, uh, uh, sorry, less than that value again would be class 2 sarcopenia. And for the women, it goes down from six, between 6.4, 6.2 and 5.4, and then less than 5.4. If we then apply that to a population, and our population currently is about 2,000 strong. It's got more than that, but this is all we've analysed at this moment in time. Then what you actually find here is that with a, this, this um, population that we've got, aged 18 to 81, we have a prevalence. We do a prevalence, and we find about 13% would be classified by this ALTMI score as being type 1 sarcopenia and about 1.5% would be classified as being type 2 sarcopenic. Well, that's fine, but that only is in with our population. I truly believe that the national-based population, ethnic, race, etc., bias is the way to go. But we need to do some comparisons here, see how everybody else defines their prevalence. So we've done it to the NHANES data, which I know you know a lot about. So we've done it to the NHANES data, I'm sorry, and we're using the third report here. 
And this is the report that is released. So I've gone too far for myself here. This is the report that's released between 1999 and 2004. And it includes about 8,000 people. I've got the wrong button I keep pressing here, apologies. It includes about 8,000 people. But the reference population is on base of 25 years. And we can estimate from the data, they're going to give it to us, that's about 200 strong, 250 strong in each of the male and female groups. And look at the, the median values that they get. When that's then translated, I have to go back here because I'm going to lose the run here. When that's then translated, what you find is that their class one sarcopenia is lower, their class two sarcopenia is lower by about a kilo of lean tissue mass in the men and about 0.7 of a kilo in the women. If we then use these criteria, and maybe the person who's following me has used them, if they use these criteria into our population, then look how it changes the prevalence. Okay, we now get about a third in class one and zero in class two. Okay, now, I told you we used an IDEXA. The NHANES data their base is done on the Hologic. It's a fan scanner, it's the Hologic. And the Hologic there that gives you different data. So, if you then say, well, we can change that. Last year, the, the, the group um, under, under uh, Vranital basically did that. They did an algorithm to convert the Hologic data into the, um, the, I, the IDEXA. And look what they came up with, even lower again. So when we now run this, and it's obvious what results are going to become, we run this back into our data over here, and the prevalence always disappears. So depending, first point, depending on how you classify your young adult range, it makes a huge difference to your outcome when you put them into populations. Okay, so we've put our, we've put our outcome and we've put it into publication for you for that. Just 30 seconds, please. This is the better way of looking at it. If we combine what we did last year on the body fat and the lean tissue mass, let's present it this way. Here's our 500 females, young. Here's our 500 females, old, or young old. Look at the way it shifts down from here. Okay. Now look at this. Here's our first clinical population. These are Crohn's disease. Look at this. Have to rescale it. This is an athletic population. These are basketballers. There is the human continuum. Thank you very much indeed. Good afternoon everyone, uh, my name is Edric Long, I'm a recent graduate from uh, University of Limerick Graduate Entry Medical School, I'm currently interning in Tala Hospital. When I was a student in uh, the geriatrics department in um, UHL, I um, was involved in uh, some research related to the geriatric syndrome known as sarcopenia. Specifically, I attempted to answer the question, is low muscle mass synonymous with sarcopenia? So let me start by telling you a little bit about sarcopenia. Um, it's, the working definition is that sarcopenia is a syndrome of a generalized and progressive loss of muscle mass and muscle function with um, risk um, of adverse outcomes such as um, low quality of life, uh, physical disability and death. The uh, widely accepted diagnostic criteria for sarcopenia is that it must include both low muscle mass and low muscle function. And low muscle function can be either low strength or low performance. And there are various methods for measuring these parameters. The most um, appropriate would be DEXA scan for muscle mass, um, handheld um, dynamometer for strength, and then usual gait speed can be used to measure low performance. Um, so sarcopenia is being increasingly recognised as a um, major clinical <coughs> issue. This slide depicts just some of the burdens associated with the disease. And to put things in perspective, uh, a study in, uh, in the US in 2000 um, found that the um, direct uh, health costs of sarcopenia 
accounted for roughly 1.5 percent of um, total healthcare expenditure. And um, I suspect that the the figures would, would be similar in Ireland. And of course, uh, with the ageing population, this is likely to get worse. The European Working Group for Sarcopenia in Older People suggests this algorithm for sarcopenia case findings. So you can see at the top, they say, um, we look at people over 65 uh, first and foremost, and um, they suggest looking at gait speed initially. And then with this algorithm, only if gait speed or grip strength are low, would you go on to measure muscle mass? And then if muscle mass is low as well, you would diagnose sarcopenia. However, one of the uh, potential limitations of this algorithm is that it would find um, cases of sarcopenia in a, at a late stage in the disease when muscle function is already affected. So one might wonder if there's an earlier stage in the disease when just muscle mass is affected. So our study looked specifically at muscle mass alone in a healthy um, older population and attempted to determine what exactly low muscle mass meant for those people. So the, uh, the data for our study came from the Health Inequalities and Aging in the Community study, otherwise known as the High ACE study. This was a joint initiative between the Sociology Department in UL and the Geriatrics Department in, in UHL. It was a cross-sectional study of 392 community-dwelling individuals, all aged over 65, and um, it involved both a, a detailed social and health survey and an extensive medical assessment. The health survey that we used was the SF36, and this is a standardised survey for um, ascertaining self-reported physical and mental health. And then a, a random subgroup of 50 individuals also had a full body DEXA scan with body composition analysis um, performed. And given that these 50 people also answered the SF36 questionnaire, we were provided with an excellent opportunity to analyze the associations between low muscle mass and self-reported physical and mental health. And it's worth noting as well that all 50 of these participants had a, a Barthel score of 20 and can therefore be considered fully independent of activities of daily living. So for the purposes of our study, we analyzed muscle mass using the skeletal muscle mass index, that's total appendicular muscle mass divided by height squares, squared, and then low muscle mass was reflected by a skeletal muscle mass index below and these cutoffs, which are the cutoffs that are recommended by the European Working Group for Sarcopenia in older people in their recent um, consensus statement. And that's defined as two standard deviations between, two standard deviations below the mean of a, a healthy young population. These are some of the characteristics of our sample population. And what I'd like to uh, highlight here is that the number of comorbidities and number of meds was low. And then the physical functioning score and the mental health score from the questionnaire was quite high. So it's fair to say that they were uh, a <coughs> relatively healthy population. Nonetheless, a significant amount of, um, of people had low muscle mass. 13.8% of females and 28.6% of males. Then we tested for um, we tested muscle mass against all the domains of the, the health questionnaire, and very interestingly, in this um, well-functioning population, there were no correlations between muscle mass and any of the domains of physical and mental health. So the conclusions that we can make, um, we can't definitely say that low muscle mass precedes sarcopenia in, in, in this population because the study was just a, a snapshot in time. However, given that there is a very high prevalence of sarcopenia in elderly people, it is, it, it's fair to say, or we can say with some certainty, that many of the people with uh, low muscle mass will go on to develop sarcopenia. And the most effective treatment for sarcopenia is physical intervention. So the findings of our study suggest that 
by screening for low muscle mass um, rather than low muscle function may allow us to identify uh, people who are at risk of sarcopenia at an early stage uh, when they're still functioning quite well and can participate in physical activity and therefore would be good candidates for um, early preventative physical intervention. Thank you.